I have several scriptures that um, that God has led me to this evening. The book of Romans, chapter number 15. The book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 10. The book of Hebrews, chapter number 2. And last reading, we will go to Ezekiel, chapter number 37. But I want to go to Romans, chapter number 15 first here. Romans 15 and verse number 4. And then 1 Corinthians, chapter number 10. And Hebrews, chapter number 2. Romans 15, 4 says, For whatsoever things were written after time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Amen. And in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 and in verse number 11 says, Now all these things happen unto them for in samples. This is speaking of the past. You're reading this, speaking of the past. And they are written for our uh, omniscient with, upon with, uh, whom the ends of the world are. Amen. And in Hebrews chapter number 2, verse number 1, amen, says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest of any time we should let them slip. Amen. And in verse number 2, for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast in every transgression and disobedience received is just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard them? God also bearing with witness both with signs and wonders. Somebody believes that tonight. And with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. One last reading, Ezekiel chapter number 37, verse number 1 says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord and sat me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. I want to preach on this thought. I refuse to die in Las Vegas. I refuse to die in Las Vegas. Let's put our Bibles down. Let's just go before the Lord and let's ask him for divine direction one more time that we would open up our ears and our minds, our hearts, understanding everything within us, God. Let us be receptible. Lord Jesus, we come before you and we're asking God, Lord, that you would touch the kids in this church, the families in this church, the adults in this church, Lord. I pray, God, you would dispatch angels into this place straight from the throne of God, Lord Jesus. Uh, whether we feel your spirit or not, God, let us be, amen, hearers and doers of your word and let us reach after God, the spirit, God, if we are so numb and so hard. Lord, I pray, God, you would break us tonight. You would open up our spirits uh, and our understanding and our minds in your precious, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise before we're seated. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. How many believe that we need revival? We need a revival. We need, we need a revival. We need more than a revival. We need a personal revival. We have to have a personal revival. We need a move of the Holy Ghost. We got to have a move of God. We've got to have a move of God. Every time we come to church, we've got to have a move of God. Every time we, it's prayer time, we need a move of God. Every time the music is playing, we've got to have a move of God. Every time the preaching is preaching, we need to have a move of God. Every time we come to the house of God, every time you call upon the name of Jesus Christ, there ought to be a move of God. I don't believe in dead church anymore. I believe that every time we come to the house of God, I believe we ought to have revival. I don't believe that we ought to come in and it ought to be a safe place. It ought to be a place where all the gossip stops and all the murmuring stops at the door and all the hatred and all the defile and everything that's within us in the human flesh. I believe that every time we come to church, we ought to have church and we ought to praise God with our spirits. We ought to praise him with everything we've got inside of us. We ought to get up out of ourselves and start to defile the flesh and say, God, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world Jesus Christ I need you more than I did yesterday I need a move of the Holy Ghost right now in my spirit these bones, these feelings these emotions, all these things that we feel 
these attitudes, these personalities, these outlooks, these inlooks, and, and all kinds of stuff. We need a visit from God. All of our personalities need a touch of the Holy Ghost. We need a visit from Jesus today. Amen. I'm not talking about tomorrow. I'm not talking about yesterday. I'm talking about we need a move of the Holy Ghost right now. We need to stop talking about revival. We need to start having revival. We need to stop talking about what used to happen back in the 50s and the 60s. And we need to start talking about what's happening right now in Las Vegas, New Mexico. We need to start talking about God being big and strong and powerful. Oh, God, I'm telling you, Jesus, uh, I don't know if I can serve you today because those mountains I climb, they're just too big. And God's saying, why don't you tell those mountains how big I am and what I can do and how I can deliver you out of bondage. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. You know what it takes to make a dramatic change in church? It takes a dramatic God. It takes God to make a change. If someone's going to change, it's going to take God to make that change. I believe people are trying to change for the wrong reasons. They're trying to change themselves. They're trying, they're trying to do everything without God. When God says, I am the only one that can do the change in your life. I'm telling you right now, TBN can't change your life. All these telebroadcasts can't change your life. The Holy Ghost is the only thing that can change somebody's life. Somebody needs to get a hold of this right now. Only God can change you. Nobody else. Not a preacher, not a man, not an individual, but Jesus Christ can only change you. John 3, 27, a man can receive nothing except it be given to him from heaven. My, my. From heaven. Let me tell you what the problem is today about church. People are looking for the abracadabra and the magic tricks. They can't save you. None of that stuff. No. Psychology words and all this type of great stuff. Yeah, it can't change you. Words, amen, cannot make a difference. None of these things, miracles, if they're going to happen, it's going to happen by Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I'm not the one who makes miracles happen. I'm the only person. I'm the only man with flesh and blood. I'm only an individual that has feelings and emotions. I'm not God, but I do serve a God who can change and who can deliver and who can make you feel better than you did yesterday, who can take suicidal thoughts out of your mind and rip them out, who can take away anxiety and pain and suffering. Amen. Addiction away. If you've got an addiction, let me tell you something. The man of God can't save you. Only Jesus Christ can deliver you. Amen. So when you think that pastor can save your life, all I can do is give you direction and an avenue towards the Holy Ghost and say this is how we counsel hell, pastor, by coming to an old-fashioned altar and saying, God, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins stupid mouth in my heart in my ways hallelujah <sighs> praise God James 1 and 7 says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the father of life everybody say cometh up C cometh down not goeth up, but cometh down. Hallelujah. What are you talking about? I'm talking about we pray a revival down. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we can't work a revival up. We've got to pray a revival that, that falls down. Hallelujah. We can crank the music and, and turn up the volume and maybe shine some purple lighting in the background and, and, and we, we'll say, wow, we've got it all together tonight. Why? Because we supercharged our emotions tonight. But after it's all over, there will be no evidence of any Holy Ghost change. No smell of sweetness of the Holy Ghost. 
Nothing like that. No anointing of his spirit. It will only be nothing but a ringing inside of our ears uh, that buzzes of what we did. Uh, uh, someone needs to get desperate enough to tell God, God, bring or send revival down. Uh, amen. That's the only way revival is going to happen. We've got to call revival down. We can't bring it up. It's got to come down. It's got to fall down. That's why the Bible says, uh, I will pour out my spirit upon all them. Uh, hallelujah. It doesn't say to raise up, uh, but it says I will pour it down. We need revival. We need revival now. Hey, listen, I refuse to die in Las Vegas, New Mexico. <laughs> hallelujah. Praise God. And from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. The prayer of the prophet is my prayer. Amen. In Isaiah 16, or 64 and 1, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heaven, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might howl down at thy presence. Praise God. My prayer tonight is that he'll somehow give us a powerful visitation. Amen. One like we've never experienced before. Hallelujah. Praise God. My prayer is that God won't just meet us, amen, here in this church building, but that God would walk the streets of Las Vegas, New Mexico, and that God would visit our homes, and God would convict us of our sins, and God would move and reign upon our spirits, uh, that every time that we are near God and we get a hold of the Lord, I pray that the Holy Ghost would give us a visitation in our city because it's not just a place here at 2107th Street uh, where we ought to get a hold of Jesus, uh, but we ought to get a hold of him at our own address, uh, and we ought to get a hold of him at a prayer meeting somewhere in the city, and I, we ought to get a hold of Jesus Christ wherever, hallelujah, wherever we take our place uh, with the Bible, and wherever we do, we've got to get a hold of God. Hallelujah. Too many of us are only living for Jesus uh, on Sundays and Wednesdays. Uh, we ought to be living for God every single day of the week. Uh, we ought to be praying in him and discipling people and telling about this truth and saying you ought to come to the house of God there's a Holy Ghost here that when you get it you'll talk in tongues you need to get baptized in Jesus name you've got to have the truth why because heaven is coming soon God's coming back for people and I don't want to be left behind I don't want to be left in this world not knowing who Jesus is I don't want to be lost and undone without God. I, I don't want to be that individual that used to run the aisles and used to worship God in spirit and truth, and, but somehow I allow bitterness in my heart and cause me to backslide in God. But oh, I don't want to die in this city, Brother Bob. I want to live for God in this city. I want to be a light that shines. I want to be an example to somebody in this city where they see me and they say, you, got, you must have something. You've got something that I really want. Why do you say that? Because I never hear you cuss. I never hear defile language coming out of your mouth. You always have a smile on your face. You're always talking about positive things. You're always being an individual that I only imagine I could ever be. You're always being somebody that I only hear about in the stories. Why? Because that's the Holy Ghost. Once you've got God living inside of you, it's going to show on the outside. If you ever have my, my, my. Come on, Hallelujah. Praise God. Give us a changing revival. I don't want to just go through the emotions, Brother Bob. I want to go through revival. I don't want to just come to church and make it a social club. Church shouldn't be a social club. It should be a place of refuge. Church should be a place where we love one another. Where a sinner walks in through the back of the doors, we ought to, we ought to hug them to death, and we ought to love them, and we ought to tell them that they're, 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 they're the best thing since sliced bread. We're so glad that you've come here today. I love you, and uh, oh, you're so weird. Why would you tell me that? Because God resides in me. God resides in me. Hallelujah. Praise God. 
well, I don't think I can get serious with God anymore. So I just keep coming to church. (sighs) Did you know in the book of Malachi that God put chains, a double lock, a combination lock on the church? And they walked up. They said, what's going on? God says, I close the church down. Why would you do such a thing? He says, because there's no more playing church. He says, I only want real people to serve me. You've made it into a nightclub. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Brother Bob, I had a crazy, crazy dream last night. I didn't even tell anybody over the phone. Brother Rodriguez, this is, going, this, this, this is probably going to blow your socks off when I tell you this dream. I woke up thinking after I had this dream, I, th- I started thinking about it. I said, God, I know you must be trying to tell me something because I know I didn't have bean and chili last night or pizza because I, 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 this dream was so vivid to me. And sometimes when, when God is dealing with me, I shut myself off to the rest of the world and even my own wife will say, I feel distant from you. It's because I'm alone with God. I'm trying to, trying to get the mind of God. And, and, and in this dream, Brother Bob, it was so interesting because I saw, us, I saw us in a new place, in a new building. I don't know what building it was, but it, I know it was our very own. It had our own name on the baptistry. That's how I knew it was ours. And before I go further in this dream, let me tell you what Elder Bishop Shirty told me not too long ago. He said, Brother Lankford, he said, when I pastored in Louisiana, he said, T.W. Barnes came and visited me. Some may know him, some may not. He's a great prophet of God who used to walk among us. and He was a giant in our generation, in our time. And Brother Shirty said that he came to my church, oh, little me, and he came and he was sitting on the platform and I wanted him to preach and, and he was getting ready to preach. And before I called him up to preach, I said, Brother T.W. Barnes, will you come on up here and I'd like for you to pray for my chair where I sit and I'd like for you to pray for it. And Brother Barnes laid his hands on Brother Shirty's chair on the platform and said, God, anoint this chair. Anoint the man of God that sits into this chair. He said, Brother Shirty, will you, or Brother Barnes, will you take this? And, and Brother Barnes grabbed the mic and started praying for it and said, God, anoint this microphone. And Brother Shirty came up to the pulpit and he said, Brother Barnes, will you come up and pray for this pulpit and lay your hands on and anoint it. And Brother Barnes came up and he had both hands on both sides of, of the pulpit and began to start to pray. And, and, and immediately he opened up his eyes and he backed away and he looked and he turned to Brother Shirty and he said, Brother Shirty, I can't pray for your pulpit and brother shirty says why not he said because your pulpit is already anointed there's already something on this pulpit god has put himself over this pulpit area there's something anointed there's something powerful that i can't even touch it i can't even get near it brother shirty said brother langford you know why he said that i said i said no sir he said because i lived And I preached holiness. And I made sure that I was I was cleansed of myself. And I lived for God the way I was supposed to live. And I didn't just have anybody behind the pulpit, but they were sent by God Himself. I thought about that after my dream. Because I saw the baptistry had our name on it. I saw the pulpit had our name on it. Uh, Everything I was looking in the dream. But here's the interesting thing about this dream. But as I was dreaming this dream and looking and having the vision and seeing everything, there was a line of people behind the baptistry. And they were being baptized one right after another and leaving out. Another one went right one in right after another. 
and going out. And I remember sobbing and crying. And, 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 and the only reason why is because everybody in that baptistry that was getting baptized, I knew every single one of them. And in my dream, they were all of POLV members. They were getting rebaptized in the name of Jesus. I said, when am I next? I want to get rebaptized in Jesus' name. God saying, I'm renewing the church. God saying, I'm going to purge the church. I said, God, no wonder I've been defiled and depressed. And God says, that's right, because I'm ruling something out. I'm going to put something in there that no man can take away, and that is within my bosom. Let me tell you something. There's a fresh anointing that's coming to the church. There's a fresh raiment of his word that's going to hit us. I don't expect applause. I don't expect all I expect is somebody, amen, with their head down in their pew and saying, God, let it be me. Jesus, let me be a part of that number. God, let me be that individual that pastor's talking about. But it was so vivid. It was so vivid. I saw the ministry. I saw the people, the saints, the Sunday school, the kids, one right after another. Getting rebaptized in Jesus' name. I, I, I didn't know what it really meant until I started praying and get a hold of God. Said, God, what is this? And God says, I'm going to purge the church. I'm going to purge the church. He says, I'm going to make myself available. He says, I'm going to be very authentic to the ones that seek me with their own heart. I'm going to make myself available. And God's going to reach those. Listen. God's going to reach those that's going to reach Him. God's going to use those that have a desire in their heart. I'm going to tell you something really scary right now. I know in the flesh I regret saying this bit of the Holy Ghost. I know I've got to say it. But there's going to be a diminishing in this church after tonight. After tonight, God's going to give it to those, your heart, if it's not right with God. If your heart is far from God, tomorrow you're going to wake up with a less desire to live for him. You're going to wake up saying, what in the world am I going to that church for? But if, you, if you're in sincerity with God tonight uh, and you say, God, I feel something in the Holy Ghost. Uh, I don't want to be left out. Uh, God's going to put something in you where you cannot stop praying, where you cannot stop getting the desire to worship, where you cannot stop uh, getting the desire to pray for an individual. God's going to give you burdens. He's going to rest upon you. And you're not going to be able to sleep tonight. Because God's going to, he's going to put a stake for your heart. He's going to pound it. He's going to stab your heart. And you're going to be pricked in your heart. And God's going to lay somebody on your spirit, on your heart to pray for. And you're going to wonder why in the world I can't get this desire off of me. I can't stop thinking about Jesus. I can't stop praying to God. And God's saying it's because I have to use you. You're all I have in this city. You're the only light that stands on top of the hill. You're the only one that carries my word and my truth and that loves me. You're the only one. God, you somebody else, not me. God say, no, the harvest is plenteous, but the labors are few. There's only a few of us here in this city that hold the light and carry the keys to the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. You may know the Bible. You may know the word. You may know all these other things, but let me tell you something right now. There's only a few. That's why the Bible says many are called, but few are chosen to enter into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called. I need a revival in my spirit. I need a revival in my home. I need a revival. Hallelujah. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we looked not for, thou camest down, the mountain flowed down at thy presence. Here's where it gets really interesting. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived 
by the ear. Neither have the eye seen, O oh God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. If we'll just crack open the door just a little bit, if we just open up just a tad, if we just kind of budge just a little bit more, he'll, he'll deliver all the goods to you and I. I have seen or hear what God can do for us. Amen. Here's what I believe. In this service right now, we can see the drug addict healed. I'm telling you what the Holy Ghost said. God's saying, I can deliver a drug addict. I can deliver cancer. I can deliver arthritis. I can deliver bone disease. I can deliver pain and cataracts and I can deliver skin disease and, and, and an oversized cyst in the ovaries. I can, I can deliver you from out of your bondage. God is saying, I've been here every time you meet, but you turn me away. I've got the power to deliver you tonight, but you refuse my hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Here we are every week, every service, healed, never touched, never healed, never moved. And the formula of the Holy Ghost is right in front of us every single service. And we don't take a hold of it. Why? Because I serve a miracle working God. I serve a God that can heal. Hallelujah. Who desires everything that I've just mentioned. Praise God. Do you believe that God can heal? Do you believe that God can change your life? Then how come we don't show God and we don't act like he can? We don't give God our 100%. Hallelujah. Amen. If it happened back then, I believe it could happen today. I believe God can do it right now. I'm not trying to tickle people's ears or trying to paint you a perfect picture and trying to give you an, an imagination. I'm trying to reach for a move of the Holy Ghost. An authentic, realistic, powerful move of God. That's the only thing that's going to move us is the Holy Ghost. Verse number 5, Thou makest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee, in thy ways, behold, thou art worth, for we have sinned, and those is continuance, we shall be saved. But we are all, listen now, we are all as an unclean thing, and all over, all our righteousness are as filthy rags, as we all do fade as the leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away, verse number 7, and there is none that cometh upon the name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. Praise God. Hallelujah. Does anybody know why? We are not free and we, ain't gonna, we don't have revival like we should. The reason why is because God, listen, I just read it to you. God has hid his face. He's hid his face because of our sins if we repent of our sins tonight you know what God won't hide from us anymore if we're open and transparent with God God here I am God's going to be open and transparent with us but he's hiding his face his face is hid because well I'll just tell you why God's face is hid from us is because we're too wrapped up into our own things and we're too consumed with our own life. And we're not worried about Jesus. And we're not worried about the, the coming of the Lord. We're not worried about salvation. We're not worried about heaven or hell. We're not worried about anything else. But we're worried about life. Ourselves. Our own life. 
We're worried about ourselves. We're too busy trying to make ends meet. We're too worried of this and that in this life. But verse 8 says, but now, O Lord, that thou art our father. I'm glad. He, I, I'm, I'm so glad. Listen, I am glad to know that Jesus Christ is our father. He's our father. We live in a city where they don't believe he's the father. You know what they believe? They believe he's the son of the father. No. He is the father. Hallelujah. We are the clay and thou art potter. And we all are the work of thy hand. Be not worth very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Praise God. I'm so glad that I have been washed in the blood. And in that dream, it was so real that God says there's going to be a cleansing. There's going to be a cleansing. I'm going to purge the church. I'm going to cleanse my people. I'm going to give them a second chance to walk in the newness of life. I'm going to give them an anointing that they've never had before. I'm going to give them power, amen, to take dominion, amen, to take authority over. I'm going to give them the Holy Ghost all over again, amen, to shake their city, to do something crazy like they've never had before. Listen to me. I am sick and tired of coming to church and it just being another Sunday and another Wednesday. Amen. I want a Holy Ghost revival every time I come to the house of God. I want something crazy to happen with God. I refuse to sit back and to die in my pew and to watch God go by. I want to be the one that gets involved with Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, when we get to that place, he don't have to hide his face anymore from us. He doesn't have to hide anymore. Amen. Praise God. And so here is the prophet crying and praying for a move of God. Behold, see, we were beseeched thee. We are all thy people, thy holy cities, are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation our holy and our beautiful house where our fathers praise thee is burned up with fire and all of our pleasant things are laid waste. You know what this tells me? These people were needing a revival. The same as we need revival. They were needing. Politicians don't have the answer, folks. Don't get wrapped up into the media. Don't get wrapped up into the, to the news stations and talking about this and that there's so much distractions the adversary the devil himself is instilling distractions from God's people he's got a hold of the world but he's trying to get a hold of you and he's trying to get a hold of your attention and he's trying to persuade you amen to stop serving God he may not be able to come to you and say don't go to that church but if he can start uh, with a plan of a seed of a small doubt uh, and it can start to grow bigger and bigger and distract you from the house of God distract Distract you, amen, from the people of God. Distract you from what God is trying to do. That's what Satan is doing today. Praise God. I'm just going to tell you the truth. Money can't save you. Money's not going to save you. It doesn't matter how much God blesses the church. You look at God first and say, God, you're my provider. Not Benjamin Franklin, not any of these other things, but God, you're my provider. As long as I put you first, God, everything else is secondary. And God says, I will take care of you as long as you take care of me. Listen, don't get sidetracked. Don't get off the beaten path of what Jesus is trying to lead you to revival. Amen. Stay focused. Stay forward. Get on the right path. Say, God, I got to get on the train of salvation. I got to get on the train of revival. Don't let me lose my vision, Jesus. And Jesus will keep you close and he will keep you near as the Bible says. Praise God. Hallelujah. What is the answer to all this? What is the answer to take? What's it going to take to have a move of God? It's going to take God to move you. But in order for God to move you, you've got to move God. You've got to get up and you've got to chase God. 
I want to read you something very interesting, something that was uh, seen here in the scripture. In verse 30, uh, number 2, chapter 37, Ezekiel, and calls me to bypass roundabout. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry, a very dry area. Verse number 3 says, And he said unto, unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. You know, I, I talk to God, and I know you've talked to God, and we've talked to God together, and we said, God, can, can this church survive? Can we have revival like we've never had before? You're more powerful, God, than the naysayers. You're more bigger than all that. And God says, yeah, I have the answer. I've got the answer. Again, he said unto me, prophesy unto these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So in this scripture, God's telling me that someone needs to speak life into existence. Someone needs to take faith, and they need to put it on their lips, and they need to speak it. Something in your life. Be the reason why there's no healing in some people is because God cannot work through doubt. God can only work through faith. You say, well, how do you have faith? How, how, where's the light switch for faith? Faith, faith is not a light switch. Faith runs by actions within the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Faith is information that we take, but we don't put to use. We talk about that information. We say what that information can do. Listen, faith is, here's the faith. When you go home and you, you got the, the lights, <clears throat> you turn on the light switch. Now what happens when you turn on the light switch? All your lights come on. Now, I'm not an electrician and I'm not a genius when it comes to those things because I don't know what happens when I turn on that switch. What happens between on that switch going all the way to the surge breakers and the wires and all the stuff, whatever it does, I know in my mind what's going to happen. The lights are going to turn on. But I don't understand it. Here's the problem. Too many people are trying to figure out God. They're trying to understand the miraculous. They're trying to understand psychology. They're trying to figure God out. Listen, don't try to understand God. Just believe that he will do the work. Just believe, amen, that God will save your lost son or daughter. Just believe that God will heal. All you got to do is say, God, here's the light switch. Bam. I don't know how it happens, but I know that it's going to happen because you said it was going to happen. Hallelujah. Someone needs to prophesy. You ain't gotta be a you ain't gotta be a licensed minister, a God called prophet to prophesy. You don't. You can speak the word in your home. Praise God. Verse number five. He says, Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And he says in verse number 6, And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring you up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. Here it is. I prophesy as I was commanded. God's commanding us to prophesy, folks. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone bones and when I beheld lo the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them above you ready what the last verse says well before I read that verse let me give you a, de a description of what happened there was dry bones they all came together and the bones came up 
And the skin, the blood, the veins, everything came upon their body. Hair, skin, everything. But the Bible says in verse number 8, in the very last verse, he says, but there was no breath in them. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, it's just like when we come to church. We'll come to church. Brother Bob will put on, sometimes some of us would just put on our best. We'll comb our hair. We'll look our best. We'll come to the house of God. And then we'll, we'll sit there with skin and bone and armor and everything, but no life inside of us at all. Nothing. Nothing at all. We'll just stand there. Empty. Nothing. Hallelujah. Praise God. Then said unto he, unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesy as he commanded me. And breath came into them. And they lived and they stood up on their feet in an exceeding great army. And he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried. Our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. God's trying to reconnect his people today in 2019. God's trying to connect you today with him. There's a disconnection right now with you and God. There's something there that's missing, and it's been missing for a long time. I'm not talking months. I'm talking years. There's been something that's been missing in your relationship with God, and it's been lost in the desert. It's been gone, and God is saying, I am here. I can heal you, but you refuse. I can touch you, but you turn away. I can move you, but you don't get near me. I can do something for you in your life. He says the closest you ever come, you better listen to me when I say this, the closest you ever come to Jesus Christ is inside this building. It's inside this building. What you talking about, Pastor? I was at the altar last week. That's it. I don't care if you pray through yesterday. We ought to pray through every single day. We ought to have a renewing of the Holy Ghost in our minds, in our hearts, in our tongues, in everything. I'm not trying to make this sound like a religious sermon. I'm just saying if we would get close back with God, God will start to do some things in our life. If we get out of the zone where we're so comfortable at, Oh, I'm good right here. Why? Because I am carved my name into my pew. And this is where I sit every service. And this is where I don't move. This is where I come. This is where it happens. Listen, in this dream, it was so real. I'm not trying to be a prophet. I'm not, I'm not trying to do all these things. I'm just saying that it was so real that even in a point of preaching the word of God, uh, it was so powerful in the service that, that even when Jesus came back for his people, I seen Brother brother Bob, I seen the roof. Uh, it looked like the roof just ripped right off uh, and, and the Holy Ghost was moving and People were shouting and people were leaving their pews and just moving up and walking and looking. And all I remember watching was the bottom of my shoes and the pulpit getting smaller and smaller and the people rising up and the people were taking off. And I said, Jesus, I want to be a part of that number. I want to be a part of your coming, Lord. I don't want to be stuck here in a desert. God, I don't want to die in Las Vegas, but I want to live for you I want to live for you Jesus I want to be I want to be connected with God knee bone to thigh bone hip bone to rib bone to the, all the bones in my body I want everybody being attached for Jesus Christ you can't live right if you've got one bone missing out of your body. You've got to have every bone to function normal like a, like a human being. So you've got to have every, 
per, you got to have every personal aspect uh, for living for God. You've got to have everything right in your soul, in your spirit, and say, God, I've got to make sure I'm connected with you, Jesus. Uh, if there's something that's disconnected with me, God, tonight, I want you to weave it out. Uh, I want you to take it out. Uh, I want you to shine it out, God, and I want to be right with you as much as I need your spirit, God. I'm coming to a close. Musicians, if you want to come, Sister Melissa, if you can just come up to the keyboard. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Why don't we all just stand at this time? Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. I want to make sure that I've got everything intact. I remember, I think it was two years ago. Two years ago, this individual wasn't coming to church. It was like pulling teeth getting this person to come to church. And I remember struggling, just praying, saying, God, it seems like I fight every single day for this person to come to church. I said, come on. Come to church. One day I messed with this individual. This was two years ago when we were in the Methodist building. I went to his house. I knocked on the door. He opened up the door. Didn't even look like the person who used to live for God. He said, hey, pastor, so good to see you. I said, hey, don't call me pastor. He looked at me like, what? I said, I just want to let you know that I'm resigning the church and I'm leaving. And we're going to take off and we got voted somewhere else. He looked at me like this. And I said, how did you just feel when I said that? He said, man, I, he said, I don't know. I felt like, I felt like, like, wow, I felt really bad. I said, brother, that's how I feel every time I don't see you in the house of God. But let me tell you something. That's how Jesus feels whenever you don't serve him and you're not living for God. I said, I was just kidding. I just said that just to get a reaction out of you. But I will tell you this. As a human being, I'm only a man. I'm not some super being powerful individual. I've got blood. I've got flesh just like you. I'm a regular old man. But I will be honest with you. There are times. Don't take this to the bank yet when I tell you this. But there are times. There are plenty of times. I can't even count how many times. But there are so many times where I want to write up a letter of resignation to the church and say, I, I'm, I don't think I'm doing a well enough job to pastor. If you're not going to live for God, maybe somebody else could help you to live for God. But then God reminds me and said, I'm purging the church. I'm cleaning the church for my sake, not yours, my sake. He says, I'm calling my people back home. I'm getting ready for the bride. My bride shall be ready. He says, I'll, I'm going to have my bride ready that there's not going to be no spot on that gown, no wrinkle on that gown. He says, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be peerless. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be so, so beautiful. No spot or wrinkle. He says, that's what I'm doing for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said, God, I, I just want to be the best, effective layman for you, Jesus. I want to serve you to the highest, to the fullest. Whatever I can do, God, I want to do it for you, Jesus. I repent of my sins. Hallelujah. That's what the Bible says. That's why when we're so defiled, you can't come to God. You can't come to God when you're drinking alcohol or doing drugs. You can't come to God and think that everything is all right without repentance. You have to repent. You have to come clean with God. That's why the Bible says He hides His face from us. He won't even look at us if we try to come to Him with sin in our life and we try to praise Him, it's no different from a charismatic individual. But when we come to Him 
and we fall to our knees and we say, oh, God, oh, God, forgive me. I've done wrong. I've defiled my flesh. God, I've been so wrong. Forgive me, God. God, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me what I've done wrong in the past. Forgive me, Jesus, when you ask God to forgive you. God says, now I can uncover my face. Now I can receive you unto myself because you have made yourself available. But you can't do it if you don't repent. <laughs> you can't come to him unrepented. That's why the Bible says, that's why the Bible says, you are drawn you are drawn except the spirit of repentance draws you that's our problem we're treating repentance like it's a a new year's resolution well i think i'll repent tomorrow i'll be all right no that's why the bible says today is the day of salvation now is the accepted time not tomorrow, not yesterday, but right now. You've got to get right with God. You've got to get alone with God. When's the last time you really got alone with Jesus and you said, God, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me, Jesus. And you got really specific with him and said, God, forgive me for this. Uh, forgive me for that. Uh, forgive me. It wasn't just words, but it was coming out of your heart. It was pouring out of your spirit uh, where the point where you started to cry and you started to sob and you started to snot around uh, and say, God, forgive me. Forgive me. Hallelujah. I believe God will start to heal when we start to repent. I believe God will start to give us revival when we start to repent. I believe that God will start to pour out His Spirit when we start to repent. These altars are open for anybody who does not want to die in the city of Las Vegas, New Mexico. I refuse to die in this city. But I proclaim to live for Jesus today. I want to live for you, God, better than I have ever lived for you. I need a reconciliation with Jesus today. I need a, uh, I, I just need to come clean with God. Well, I don't need to go to an old-fashioned altar to get right with God. I'll get right where, where I am. Let me tell you something. God's trying to weave out that spirit right now. God's trying to diminish that spirit. He's trying to get rid of it. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, you keep that spirit and that attitude up long enough. God's not going to give you a desire to even come back to the house of God. You're going to wake up just like he said tomorrow and say, I don't even know why I'm going to church anymore. But all along, God says, that's because I forced them out and gave them up to a reprobate mind. But I've kept the ones. I've kept the ones that are going to serve me. I kept the ones that their hearts surround me. Hallelujah. Come on. If you feel any pricking in your heart tonight, I beg you to come to this altar. I beg you to get out of your pew tonight. And I beg you to walk through this altar. I want you to come up and lift up your hands and say, God, forgive me of my sins. God, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me, Jesus, of my ways, my attitude, my spirit, God. <laughs> oh, God, I don't want you to hide from me anymore. I'm done playing hide and seek, God. I will make myself available for you. Come on. Come on, somebody get right with God right now. Somebody get your heart right with Jesus right now. Don't you leave this place until you've been changed. Don't leave this place until you've repented of your sins. Don't leave this place until you got right with God and until you have a relationship again with Him.
church of God do you want tonight? Jesus, hallelujah. God, I've got to have a breakthrough. There's got to be a loosening in my spirit. There's got to be a change in my mind. There's got to be a change in my ways. Come on. Don't just leave with five minutes of worth of God. Leave with an eternity with Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah.